did last year. Here we go. Um, oh dear, that's just a bit. There we go. Um, um, yeah, I'm going to try and answer the question: Where do adults accumulate their physical activity? Um, this paper um, was actually published last, at the end of last year, alongside the recent um, WHO guidelines for physical activity. So it's actually real. Um, I'm really grateful for the chance to talk about it a bit more because so much of the public uh, publicity at the time was around the guidelines and um, so it was great to sort of publicize this work a little more and uh, get to hear other people's perspectives on things. Um, I'll start with a bit of an introduction to, to get some definitions. Many of you will probably be aware of these things but just to um, get us all on the same page. Um, I'm using the definition of physical activity um, Oh, that from Casperson that it's any uh, bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. And as you can imagine, that can be undertaken in a variety of contexts um, and what I'll call from here on domains. A, a quick Google search of pictures uh, brings up examples of that. So there's no copyright rights asked for on these pictures, so apologies for that. But um, you can think of physical activity happening at work. You can think of it happening in the leisure. You could, it could happen in the household, I haven't got a picture for that, or it can happen for travel. Um, so it is really important to understand the domain, the context of physical activity, if you're going to try and change it. Um, if you are trying to intervene at a population level or even an individual level, but I'm gonna talk about population level, we need to understand what the population is currently doing and what there is the possibility for people to, to do, or maybe there aren't possibilities for people to do it. Um, so for policymakers, you really need to understand this context if you're going to direct um, uh, policies and uh, resources um, accordingly. Physical activity guidelines at the moment, as I said, they were just released at the end of last year. Um, they're to do two and a half hours of moderate intensity activity a week. Um, moderate intensity equates to a brisk walk, roughly. Um, but if you do more intense activity than that, that um, confers additional benefits and so we have this slightly um, kind of a balance of the two intensities moderate and vigorous where you can we sort of think the vigorous kind of counts double um, you, if you did 75 minutes of vigorous that should confer the similar benefits to 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity at least in very crude terms um, and this is something that I'll um, have to implement in my analysis so I'll go on to mention that again later. In terms of how it links to diabetes, I'm sure you're all very aware of um, the associations between physical activity and many chronic diseases, but particularly um, type two diabetes. The evidence I've got here is coming from the US 2018 Physical Activity Guideline Report. Um, and it follows a similar pattern to many uh, chronic diseases, for the, at least the association uh, follows a similar pattern, which is this, what we call a curvy linear dose response relationship. And the key characteristics of this, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the, the key characteristics are really a biggest, the biggest drop in the relative risk of developing type two diabetes happens between doing no activity and doing some. And then from there, there's a, there's a continued benefit, but it slightly plateaus. And that's what we often call in physical activity, the dose response relationship. Um, and um, so it's apparent for type two diabetes alongside uh, other conditions like cardiovascular disease. I'm actually working on some UK biobank analysis at the moment that tentatively is showing almost a more linear relationship um, rather than this curvy linear. And so maybe I'll have to come back when we're further down the line with that and, and talk about that. But um, certainly type two diabetes is one of the conditions where you see the stronger uh, reductions in risk um, out of all chronic conditions um, associated with physical activity. And I'm sure you uh, are also aware then that the position stand from the American Diabetes Association acknowledges this, um, talking about the role of um, physical activity in preventing or delaying development, so the primary prevention, but also secondary treatment um, that is uh, useful for, for that. Um, it uses the term exercise, which is a sort of subset of physical activity, the more structured intentional activity, but you could substitute the word physical activity here and it would still apply. I hope that little introduction has given you a bit of an idea as to why we should care about physical activity in type 2 diabetes. 
world and also why we should care about the domains of physical activity. I'm now going to go on to talk about the results of the paper and well and first a bit of the methods as to what we did. The aim specifically for this work was to look at activity undertaken in the work and household, they're grouped together, travel and leisure time, um, and to look at how that contributes to the total amount of activity that different countries are undertaking and how it, contrib how, how it relatively contributes, as in what percentage of, an, uh, of a country's activity is coming from travel, for example. We're focusing in on this moderate to vigorous physical activity, so the activity that would count towards the guidelines. Um, and we're looking across 104 countries. A secondary aim is to look at whether the uh, different domains vary by age or sex uh, subgroups. The data we have, all um, 104 countries, the, the key sort of inclusion criteria for the data sets was that they use the global physical activity questionnaire. And this is a questionnaire that asks about the frequency and duration of physical activity undertaken in the typical week um, in the domains that I've just mentioned, work and household, travel and leisure. In work and household and leisure, the uh, questions are separated from moderate and vigorous intensity. And this allows us to do that doubling of vigorous intensity activity to equate it to the guidelines. Um, it doesn't apply to travel because it's just all assumed to be moderate intensity. But it's, it's pretty easy then to um, work out how to get a weekly time. You just multiply the frequency by a session duration. Um, and so that's how we end up with the total minutes um, for each of the domains and in total. Here is a map of uh, where our data come from, and it's the white areas the where we don't have data. And this may seem like the inverse to what you're used to, where it's actually sort of the European countries where we, we don't have data, and it's um, more the rest of the world, a lot of lower middle income countries where we do. Ignore the shading for the minute. Um, anything that's got a color on um, has data, but I'll discuss a little bit about that shading in a minute. The reason for the lack of data in the uh, European countries is because we, the GPAC has primarily been used as part of the WHO stepwise surveillance um, program. And I'm guessing there may, some of you may be familiar with this, but the WHO runs, um, well, has a sort of template or a protocol for a national survey to look at non-communicable disease risk factors of which physical activity is one and the GPAC is, is the questionnaire they use. And so the WHO um, often assists countries to run these surveys um, and um, following this protocol. And because many of the European countries already have national surveillance programs in place, they don't take this offer up, they, they, they don't do that. So that explains why um, we don't have GPAC data from most of Europe, but we do from um, a lot of African, um, and uh, Southeast Asian countries, particularly. So 94 of our 104 uh, surveys came from, from that sort of steps program. Six came from another WHO program called SAGE, which is very similar, but has a slightly more focus on older adults. Um, and then four surveys were national surveys that did happen to use the GPAC as their questionnaire. Um, off the top of my head, they were Brazil, Chile, USA, and Korea. Um, and US and Korea were particularly useful um, because they're as high income countries, um, they, we, yeah, we didn't have so many of them in our data sets. It was nice to be able to add, add them in. Data were collected um, at any, between 2002 and 2019. That's not to say it spanned the whole, the data collection spanned that whole period. Surveys were undertaken usually um, over a few months um, at um, any year in that period, really. 90, yeah, so most of, this, most of the surveys um, followed a multi-stage cluster stratified uh, survey design, um, which um, often means that your raw sample you uh, 
end up with isn't necessarily representative of the population on many demographic characteristics. So it's common to apply weights to uh, normalize that um, in terms of key characteristics, often age and sex. So 91 of our surveys provided uh, survey design variables and we used them when they were available. I mentioned some of the countries in that previous map were colored in sort of gray. They were to indicate that they were sub-national surveys um, and they often varied in terms of whether they covered urban and rural areas. There was a huge amount I could say on this, but I don't think it's probably of great interest um, to all of you in the group. So if you are interested, do go and look in my supplementary materials for this paper or drop me an email or ask at the end and I'm happy to go into more detail. But essentially, if there was an issue with it being subnational and having varying urban rural coverage, we created our own weights to kind of apply up to a population distribution and in some cases imputed if it was urban or rural only. So that was how we dealt with those issues, but there's a lot more I could say on that if, if that is of interest. Getting on to what our actual sample was, we obviously just excluded, uh, well, not maybe not obviously, but we did decide to exclude individuals if they were missing key variables that we needed. So age, sex, any survey design, and anything implausible or missing inconsistent in the physical activity data. We restricted the age range to 25 to 64 years because um, that was common across all surveys, but it was also quite helpful because when we were looking at um, sort of contribution of work and household activity, that is obviously, you, you, it's nice to get a working age population as a comparison across all, across all countries and not have to, um, worry too much about uh, getting into the much older age groups or, or much younger age groups um, there. So it actually served another purpose as well. And that left us with a data set of over 327,000 individuals spread across 104 countries. Moving on to some results then. So what I've got here, are some frequency distributions. I've just screen grabbed um, some in alphabetical order, but um, every 100, all the 104 countries are in the supplementary materials if it is of interest. Um, but I just want to show you what the underlying data look like in terms of minutes um, per week of activity. Like most self-report data, you get this really high zero spike um, and then a distribution that has often got a very long tail. Um, the sort of jagged uh, nature of some of the distribution is particularly apparent in travel. That's to do with digit preference. So it's people who report round numbers for their activity. And uh, yeah, it's particularly apparent in, in the travel domain when people do something for half an hour uh, on a more regular basis. So that explains why um, the shapes are like they are. But there's still variation between countries. Quite considerable variation, actually. Um, you will see that the mean values are therefore not entirely representative of a distribution that looks like this. And um, I am gonna go on to talk a lot about mean, mean values. Um, so this slide was just to sort of make you aware of what the data look like underneath. We have good reason for using mean values. There aren't actually great alternatives when you're trying to look at relative contributions. Um, but uh, certainly further analysis that, um, considers the distribution maybe in a more sort of split model um, between looking at those that are participating and not, and then looking at the actual distribution as I've done in some other work, I think that would be a way forward if you were gonna do more detailed analysis. This slide, I don't know if it's too small on your screens, um, I'll show similar um, data, I'll show a summary in the next slide. But what you have here is the 104 countries, a bar for each country, and on the y-axis is the total minutes per week, but it's color-coded by the domain. So the darker one is work and household, the lighter gray is travel, and then the top um, middle gray is leisure time. So you can see immediately that across all the countries, um, the work and household is not in it's not 100% of the countries where it's the highest, but it is for a lot of them, it's, it's a major contributor. Um, and uh, yeah, but there are variations in terms of 
what, what the contributions are. Um, my screen, because I've got you guys in the bottom, I can't actually get down to this bottom area where you can see, um, I think it's Korea and Kuwait, I think are the lowest countries. It's kind of blocked for me at the minute, but um, they're about the only countries where the mean uh, minutes of physical activity are um, around the guidelines. Every All other countries are, are far exceeding that. And that isn't a surprise. If you, it chimes with the work of Regina Goodhold, who has looked at prevalence of physical activity across these countries. I'm um, using, uh, to be honest, basically the same data. This is a table that maybe will give a few numbers to that previous bar chart. What we've got here in the first column is the mean of the country means. Um, the range is the interquartile range under that. I realize that's like mixing means and interquartile ranges, but that's what happens when you go through a re review process. Um, but uh, here we have, um, you can see that at, across the 104 countries, the mean of the means was 950 minutes. Uh, for work and household, which was double that of travel. And again, over double that of leisure. So that's giving you a sense of, of the relative contributions immediately, but we'll talk about that more. You can see then also um, the how this varies by income classification. So I've got low, lower, middle, upper, middle, and high here. And you can see as we go across the, uh, the amount of work and household activity basically halves between um, low and high income countries. A similar trend is seen for travel and um, leisure, the opposite trend is seen. In fact, it doubles um, when you're looking at high compared with low um, income countries, but we're talking about much lower volumes uh, in any case. Comparing men and women, we can see that the known inequality where women report much lower volumes of activity than men, we can see that across all domains. Um, and But the age group's not so apparent here, and this is probably because we're, we're looking at sort of what you may call young middle-aged and older middle-aged, rather than the sort of extremes of um, young adults and, and uh, much more elderly. That, that uh, typical inequality isn't as evident, but there are still some differences. We're now gonna look at the relative contribution of the domains. And there are two ways of calculating this. So I just want to highlight this so that it, it's because it's important for the interpretation. What we did was um, go to each data set. So let's take an example country of India. We'd take the data set of India and we'd, for each individual in that data set, we'd add up the, their activity levels by adding up the three domains I've just mentioned. And then for each individual, we would calculate what the relative contribution of each domain was. So for example, travel, if uh, an individual did one hour of travel and four hours of work household activity, they would have a contribution of 20% for travel. If they just did one hour of travel and nothing else, travel would contribute 100%. And so then what we ended up doing would be the, the India average then would be the average contributions um, across all the individuals in the data set. So it, what it meant was that if an individual did really high volumes and this particularly applied to the work and household domain, if someone reported a lot of work, the maximum that it could contribute is 100% for that one individual. And, and that's quite an important thing because the alternative method, which has been done in the literature before, is that you get your India data set and you just add everybody's minutes all together and you say the whole data set undertook this many minutes of activity. Uh, you know, it could be 60,000 minutes of activity or whatever. And let's say 20,000 of them came from travel. And then we'd say, well, for India, I'm not going to be able to do this off the top of my head, <laughs> but yeah, you'd have a third of the activity is coming from travel. As a, as a pooled sample. The problem with that approach is that those that are doing really high volumes of activity um, count more because they're, you, they're contributing more of the information to this pooled data set. So it does mean 
that it doesn't really cap the activity. If someone reports really, really high volumes of one domain, they, they could just completely skew um, a sample thing. So that's the reason why we've gone with the first approach, this individual, meaning that if someone reports a lot in one domain, all they're gonna do is contribute 100% for one individual. Um, having explained that, I'm now gonna try and explain um, how we present the data. Um, this is a ternary plot. You may have seen this from other compositional analyses. But what we're trying to display here is the three-way coordinates, so the contribution of work, household, travel, and leisure. If I take this example um, here, this KWT stands for Kuwait, and it's really nicely placed on the intersection of some of these lines, so we should be able to work it out quite easily. The first thing to do is look along this axis, which is the percentage of activity from work, household, and you can see um, it's on the 20% line. So Kuwait, the average contribution of work household in Kuwait was 20%. Moving to this axis, the percentage from travel, we can see that it's also on the 20% line. Follow that down. And then unsurprisingly, because it's got to add up to 100, we can see that it's the leisure activity, it is actually matching on the 60% line. So that's how you'd interpret the coordinates of, an, of a country, and like Kuwait here, 60% from leisure, 20 work household and 20 travel. So that's obviously quite an outlier, um, but the bulk of the distribution, the bulk of the countries are in this part of the, the, the triangle which if you look as, okay, so what does that mean? They're kind of between the 40 to 80% lines on work household. They're roughly between the 20 and 60% lines for travel. And they're under the 20% line for leisure. So I hope that gives some sense of where the countries are fitting. And I'm about to present the same information in another format. Um, so if you didn't get your head around this, there's, there's another, another chance to, to go. Yeah, so this triangle is exactly the same triangle as I've just presented. The dots are in the same place, that was Q8. Um, but instead of having the country names, they're just dots. And um, what we have is a slightly more color coded um, chart. The lines intersection um, represents the, the mean of the country means. Um, and that happens to fall at about 50%, 52% work household, um, 36 travel, and 12 leisure. I realize I'm just sort of saying loads of numbers here, but if you take what this helps us do is it says, okay, so if a country is colored pink in the map above, then um, it's representing that this country is doing, that has, it has a greater contribution of leisure than the average. And if it's um, colored in more blue, then it's got more work household than the average. And if it's yellow, it's got more travel than the average. So looking up to our, our map, we can see that it's not surprising there's a lot of green because that's sort of that intersection of the, the round about the average. But the pink is standing out, some high income countries, um, America, uh, you, can, you probably can't pick out Kuwait because it's, it's tiny. Um, and uh, Korea also, some of the uh, islands are more pink than the average. Um, and so that's the higher contribution of leisure. And then we can see um, some of the travel, higher contribution of travel coming through in the yellows here in uh, sort of West Africa. I sort of alluded to the idea that the pink leisure was associated with high income countries. This plot here is again, it's the same plot that you've seen now. Um, just the dots are now replaced with colored shapes to indicate where the income classification uh, lies. And whilst I don't think I can distinguish a huge amount between the low, lower, middle and upper, I do feel like the red uh, of the high income countries 
is indicating that they are further towards this end of the triangle. They are further along the contribution of leisure um, than than the sort of the, than the rest of the country. So I think we can we can see that trend coming out from this plot. Here it is in table format. Um, I've already said these numbers to you of the sort of country level averages of, of the contribution of work. Uh, household and travel and leisure. Um, but we can see then how this varies. We can actually add numbers to these sort of um, uh, income classifications. So when I said, sorry, there was a much uh, higher contribution of leisure in the high income countries, we can see that um, notably um, the percentage is nearly 30%. Um, and you can, as we'd expect then that the, um, the other domains the relative contribution is 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 lower because it's obviously all got to add up to 100 so um we can see the trends a lower contribution of work here and, and a lower contribution of travel interestingly we didn't see huge differences between men and women so we did see quite high absolute differences as i showed you in the table before but we're not really seeing much in the relative contribution um there are some tendencies i'll talk about in the next slide but not not huge differences. And similarly for the age groups, um, not, not massive differences between, between them. If all these mean differences are a little bit too much, another way of thinking about it is thinking about the rank order of the domains. Um, so this is showing you the number that um, of, of countries that had their mean work was higher than their mean travel, which was higher than their mean leisure. And that applied to 70 of the 104 countries. And a further 10 just had leisure and travel swapped around. So for 80 of the 104 countries, work and household was the main contributor. Um, for all other countries, except one, travel was the largest contributor. There was only one country where leisure was the largest contributor, and that was the Q8 that we've already pulled out um, and discussed. I mentioned I discuss a little bit more about age and sex differences. Um, so there's, if you were going to pick out anything, there was a tendency towards um, more travel and lower work and household for women compared with men. Um, another way I looked at differences was by looking at how many countries had a greater than 10 percentage point difference in the relative contributions um, in any domain. And it didn't come up with a huge amount, but where there were differences, they were more apparent in the high and middle income countries. Um, so that might be something to uh, go into in more detail at some point. The age differences were really not as well pronounced. Um, there were, when there were differences, there were no patterns. It, I couldn't even say there was a tendency towards anything. Um, again, when there were differences, that did seem to be more in the higher income countries. Um, but I really think, this is the sort of analysis that could do with a much more specific uh, in-depth look at rather than trying to characterize uh, distributions across 104 countries it would be much better to look at maybe one country maybe with a few comparator countries that, that are, are relevant and uh, to be undertaken by someone with much more uh, country specific knowledge than I personally have um, because I think that's that's where you would start to, to get the most out of these data. I'll just finish up then with a few, what I think of as implications of this work. And um, I do think this information would, could um, inform the development of interventions and policies um, to increase physical activity. That's really the point of it. Um, we may have already known, this may feel like, oh, you've told me everything, I, I would have assumed this anyway, but it's really important to quantify um, how important the domains are. So the work household reliance in low and middle income countries is not um, rocket science to have worked out, but it's good to have quantified it, quantify the extent of it. It is particularly important for policymakers because if we're looking at whether what's going to happen to physical activity as countries go through economic transitions, uh, we need to be really mindful as to whether um, the opportunities 
for work and household activity will, will continue? And if they don't, what, what are countries going to do about it to make sure that um, there are still the opportunities to be active? Travel is such an obvious area for policymakers to focus on. Um, it's quite prevalent already in many countries across um, different income classification groups. But it's really important that as infrastructures develop uh, or get replaced, uh, no matter what country it's in, it's really important that um, active, the opportunity to be active is, is considered um, in new development. I can't get through a whole presentation on the domains of activity without mentioning the um, so-called activity paradox, which is the hypothesis that occupational activity either doesn't confer the same benefits as leisure time activity, that maybe there's no association between occupational activity and, and health outcomes, or even that it's detrimental for health. That is definitely an area of research that has got a lot of um, discussion going. Um, and if true, it would obviously have huge implications for many of the countries featured in this analysis. However, I think it is so important to not panic and not associate the two, this research with that research um, without really considering that a lot of the activity paradox research has been carried out in high income countries and that the nature of work and also the confounding structure around activity at work could be very, very different. In high income countries, we often would uh, count an indicator of manual labor as essentially being an indicator of sort of social economic position. Um, so there could be many reasons why these results are being found. And it is really important that um, whilst we don't ignore this potentially emerging, emerging uh, research, because it, it could have huge implications, we also should not, um, should not overinterpret it, or we should interpret it all with caution. That leads me to my final slide, just to say thanks very much for listening and uh, really looking forward to some discussion. My acknowledgements are all there, um, funding by the MRC, and there's a huge number of people who um, collected these data, curated these data. I don't even know them all. There's a huge list in the paper um, and with this sort of work would never be possible without them. So very grateful to that. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa. I think it was such a wonderful presentation. You really brought everything down to earth, and I think everybody here really understood most of the things that you were saying. So if you have any question, please feel free to type in the chat or just unmute yourself. But in the absence of any question, I'm happy to ask one. So you concluded by talking about the activity paradox, occupation activity paradox. And I mean, my knowledge from masters, whenever we came across any paradox being the obesity paradox or the aspirin paradox in medicine, it was because of um, incorrect adjustment on maybe a covariate, for example, a collider. And this resulted in the paradox that we often observe. So in this study or in this study suggesting the activity paradox, like have they checked if a covariate has not been incorrectly, like a covariate that is rather the consequence of the exposure and the outcome being adjusted for and leading to all these things? That's such a great question. Yeah, so um, there's actually been a recent study out by a different set of authors. Uh, a lot of the authors who um, sort of promote the paradox are based in Scandinavia, but there's been another Scandinavian group that have looked um, at uh, the issue of has there been suitable covariate adjustment and um, that was a very useful paper and they weren't they were not able to find strong evidence for the paradox when when looking at this sort of covariate adjustment so it's absolutely an area that needs to be looked at more I don't think it's the end it's not the end of the story it's not like oh that explains it all fine it will go away because it's not the end of the story there, there's there's more going on than that um, I can find links after this and share them if people are interested, but um, no, I mean, I think it's a very interesting area. I think covariate adjustment is absolutely huge issue for me. I think in Western societies, as I mentioned before, 
the issue of manual work is just so strongly associated with socioeconomic position and then a whole host of other um, lifestyle risk factors for chronic disease. So even if you had um, all the variables, even if you were including them all in the model, we don't, they're not all perfectly measured. They're not all capturing the full sense of what, what the confounding structure is going on. I think the last thing I would say though, is that it is isn't undoubtedly the case that some manual work, very repetitive under high strain, is bad for musculoskeletal conditions. And we just need to be careful that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about which outcomes, um, and that whilst uh, injury risk is one outcome and it is a health outcome, it is a very different outcome from all cause mortality or cardiovascular disease or diabetes. And we just need to make sure that we, we don't conflate the different outcomes um, across them, I think. Thank you. But I'm really fascinated. If others here uh, have thought about it from a type two diabetes point of view, I'm really fascinated to hear um, other perspectives. Any comments, any questions? Just unmute yourself. <clears throat> Uh, I could ask a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was a very good uh, and interesting presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I couldn't stop but thinking about when you presented uh, the distribution between uh, travel and, and work and leisure time, physical activity, that a lot of those countries that ended up in uh, the pink uh, part where I think I would guess just on the top of my head, looking at your map, that a lot of those were those who had have among the highest prevalence of obesity among the countries. That have you have you looked into compared anything of prevalence uh, of obesity? Because I was also thinking in terms of men versus women. When we uh, like globally, there is a high prevalence of obesity among women, and especially in these countries that you have uh, studied uh, and. Uh, I was, I was very interested in those. You're totally right. So that's basically what I really want to go on to do next. And when you asked, someone asked at the beginning when I was writing, am I going to do more on these data set? That's really what I want to do. The issue, as you mentioned, yes, you could look at the prevalence of obesity, but um, as the figures stand at the minute, it would have to be at a, an ecological level. It would have to be yeah, at a yeah. country level. And so whilst I think that is a really interesting thing to do, there are obviously huge pitfalls that one could fall into if one mm. looked at prevalence mm. of obesity. So it's definitely something I would like to do, but I'm mindful of that limitation. The one saving grace is that these data, that at least the ones from the STEP survey, um, many of them have a subsample where they have collected biomarkers like resting heart rate, blood glucose, um, and they've also sometimes measured BMI. It's often mm. in a subsample, the weighting, I think we'd lose any sense of national representativeness, but mm. it would be really interesting to look at domain specific associations um, in data from the, the range of countries that we have. Um, of course, we could pick up UK Biobank and do that analysis in there, but we have so much data from West high income Western countries. So I think the utility would be to have this international perspective and to start getting at that. So absolutely, I would love to, um, just trying to work out the best study design to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and another in interesting aspect I was thinking about was, uh, it's so interesting that you uh, that you look at these parts uh, differently, you know, work and, and uh, travel and uh, leisure time. And a lot of time there's, I feel like in, I, I don't know, but like my feeling is that there's so much focus on, le on leisure time, physical activity in research, like, and, and often that's the only thing that they measure. And, um, and but I have the feeling that there is a little bit more uh, focus on active transportation as well in recent research. And it's very interesting because I, I was um, thinking about this a couple of months ago, because in Sweden, you, you can get reimbursed from your employer if, uh, if you have like a leisure time physical activity, if you have a gym card or if you uh, sign up for a run or something, but there is no um, reimbursement for if you do something in terms of active transportation to work. And if we're looking at it from an environmental perspective as well, if you want to promote active transportation, 
and you know having the opportunity to then both get some free exercise and uh, help the environment out there, there, there should be more in incentives to to reimburse for you know ways to be more uh, yeah have more active transportation that's fascinating it's fascinating to hear the perspective in sweden i think in the uk we certainly have what's called the cycle to work scheme or we have had oh. and that means that basically gets you uh there's some tax situation where it, it helps you buy a bike essentially um so there's definitely have been i mean it, it, there have been initiatives but i also have to say that um to be honest the infrastructure in many parts of the uk is insufficient to allow people to travel uh, by bike and it also requires a certain skill set and confidence and although our weather isn't quite the same as Sweden in the winter it's still it's not always <laughs> pleasant and great to cycle in the dark and the wet so there are many other barriers um, so I think whilst it's really interesting and great to hear about government incentives that are domain specific as well um, it shouldn't stop the, the broader policies and the infrastructure and opportunities being there. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to uh, consider what, what could be done, like where are the government, where is government policy best directed if one is going to try mm. and promote, uh, and, and is it in individual incentives? I don't know. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Any other question? <clears throat> Hi, Tessa, it's Jamie. Um, you mentioned with the biobank uh, data that they're showing a linearity with the relative risk curve. That's quite a thing. <laughs> that's uh, that's um, potentially undermining the vast majority of models that have been <laughs> built on physical activity relative risk. Is, is that something that is, um, is uh, on the horizon, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, no, I maybe, I don't know how much I should have said, but um, no, I know that um, we have just started this analysis. Um, if you, I know Nick Wareham, uh, so the, the head the director of the MRC epidemiology unit uh, that I work for, uh, he presented these data in a conference, uh, I think at the American Diabetes Association. Again, I can find that out and send a link. And I don't know if the presentation was online, but um, we were looking at the log odds of type two diabetes in the UK biobank sample. Um, and if I remember correctly, it was accelerometer measured physical activity. And we were seeing somewhat of a, a linear association more than, yeah, that, that wasn't necessarily conforming to the dose response. That was quick analysis that was done for a presentation. I mean, it was done comprehensively, but we are now looking at extending it to write a paper on that. So that's the stage that the work is at. It's definitely not citable, um, but what okay. I will try and do is see if I can find a link to his presentation and so that you can follow that up if you're interested and um, ch check that I've said what I think the results show correctly. Thank you. Well, and, and kind of on that note on kind of these objective measures of now, we, I also wondered about that like curvy uh, dose response relationship and, and maybe it's something about measurement or maybe it's, I also thought maybe it could be something about more biology, right? That there, we know that there is some sort of like constrained uh, biology of physical activity, right? So if you keep doing more and more, we know at least for weight loss, there is some sort of balancing act around that which is really really interesting so yeah so there could be uh, different things at at work here but that was actually not my question my question was more like so okay so this is a huge analysis a lot of countries a lot of things to kind of uh, uh, yeah a lot of data here and of course uh, it's it would be really hard to i guess measure everyone like using these objective measures of uh, physical activity but i also think that that's something that have really improved like physical activity epidemiology over the, the years, right? Um, kind of getting a bit better measure of physical activity. Do you think that if you had like these measures, would you have found something else? Or like just speculating on that? Because of course the GPAC, it says something about kind of physical activity in around a week's time. And I'm not really sure about the time period, but how it's just like a, a normal week, I would guess, right? 
yeah, how would you say like a normal week how much travel etc do you do yeah so great do, great yeah. questions and it's really interesting to think so i i won't pick up on all the points in the right order but hopefully i'll get to all of them um I think it's the important, yeah, I think accelerometers are really great at being able to pick out um, some of the like movement that we weren't otherwise counting. So I showed you that the self-report data obviously often have this big spike at zero and then there's a distribution. And that is usually moderate to vigorous activity. So we're not counting the incidental stuff, but even then um, it's, it's a feature of people just being like, I'm not an active person. No, I don't answer these questions. And then the people who are active sort of engaging with the questionnaire. And although there are many, much error associated with self-report methods, I don't like to blame the respondents. It's often said, oh, people over-report. I think it's so much a feature of the questionnaire. You get to report the number of days and an average duration. And if you're doing things, if you've got to an end of a questionnaire and you're just trying to do things quickly, it's so hard to really think of what that average is. And just a small difference can make a big, big change when you multiply out weekly frequencies. So these questionnaires inherently encourage a sort of va like vague reporting. And But what's amazing is that they still are showing some quite strong response, dose response associations, that they still have an ability to discriminate. They seem to still at least be able to rank individuals correctly, even if the absolute values could be a bit off. So yeah, I think in terms of uh, do will we see a different dose response association with uh, device measures? I think that's an absolutely plausible hypothesis, but the evidence isn't showing that so far. So even now we're looking at the whole spectrum of light intensity activity and um, yeah, I've published on UK Biobank data on this before, we're still seeing a dose response. So I think that's interesting, but I could totally see the hypothesis as to why. Um, but yeah, it seems still that the biggest differences are going from nothing to something and, and then it plateaus off. With regards to could we implement uh, these objective measures more widely in this huge data set? Absolutely. UK Biobank has shown us that we can do it in the UK with you know, 100,000. Um, but we've recently done a pilot in Malawi and showed that we can easily add in accelerometry alongside steps surveys and I think uh, Camille works a lot on Cameroon data where they've also shown um, great success with um, accelerometry. So uh, um, I know there are other pilots, Moldova, possibly Fiji. So I think we're, we're getting a sense there are definitely cultural specific things that need to be taken into account um, and sort of practicalities alongside different survey methodologies, but it's, it's possible. The problem though is that it, unless we can't ascertain what domain that activity comes from. So an analysis like I've just shown here really wouldn't be possible unless you also included diaries. And once you're also including diaries, that's a huge participant burden. One of the best things about these wrist-worn devices is people go away and forget about them for a week. Um, and so once we come back to diaries, we come back to the same issues of what, what are people doing? So I hope that's covered most of what you <laughs> asked there. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it surely did. And I just, uh, yeah, I think, but it's really one of the, uh, I think, good strengths and very nice developments in the, that field, right? That uh, you can you can do that. I'm like, I'm working with diet and I think I'm a little bit yeah. behind on that front, uh, but uh, I think also moving a little bit towards that, but it, it's just really, really interesting. And, and I guess you've also made a lot of thought a lot about so this country, what what is my like prejudice about this country? Like Kuwait there and down there and up there, and I just there's so many things going on when you compare different countries. Um, yeah, but it's really interesting, and 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 as you say here, we can see some really clear patterns. So I think it's uh, yeah, it's really a nice nice paper and, and presentation as well. Oh, thanks very much. I'm very aware that it's a crude overview of, like I say, it's a country level. It's a cross-country comparison. And I do, as I think I mentioned, I really do think that there's a lot more to explore in these data and that needs to be done by people who have more expertise in the countries. I was very aware that, um, yeah, if you're gonna go into more detail than I have done in this paper, that needs country-specific knowledge. If you're gonna start talking about the policies and the environment, <clears throat> that, that, that's necessary. Thank you. So Tessa, maybe, I think we have time for one last question and I really have a burning question. So in your conclusion, you did mention LMICs, so low and middle income countries. 
And then you also made this statement that has been ringing, like where should the government best direct their policies? So if you look at the table two so that you presented, so you can see that <clears throat> it looks like low and middle income countries are doing well in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of relative numbers. And in your conclusion, you have maybe trying to emphasize more on work physical activity because as these countries become urbanized, there may be a reduction in these work activities. And so how should countries try to preserve these, these activities going on? So I'm wondering when you look at, for example, diabetes, so if you look at the International Diabetes Federation, so I think African countries are beginning to understand why they should try to invest in diabetes because even though the burden of diabetes seems to be low at the moment, there is some data suggesting that in the next 30 years, for example, they would get to an uncontrollable level. But then with physical activity, your data seems to be showing that low and middle income countries are doing well compared to high income countries who are already investing a lot on physical activity on trying to build cycling lanes, encouraging people with incentives and everything. So with this data, like, do you think, I mean, Africa and let's say, you know, low and middle income countries, policymakers in low and middle income countries, do you think they should be encouraged or motivated to kind of redirect their policies towards physical activity and things like that? So what do you think about it? Yeah, great question. A lot in there. I mean, I think the thing that's the first thought that springs to mind is that I guess one thing that doesn't come out strongly from this is the um, relative age profile of different countries because it's representative of each country or it, it's it's aiming to be but what that doesn't show is that uh, the you know the median age in many African countries is so much lower than many high-income countries and so that is also a huge determinant of type 2 diabetes um, yes. so um, I think and, but it's also associated with higher physical activity levels. So I think just because the snapshot of prevalence in activity looks good right now, I think the combination of the mean median age, the combination of knowing that the work physical activity has the potential to decline. And if that does, then where is the other, where is the infrastructure, where are the opportunities to replace that? I think that that means that it absolutely should be on country's radar. I mean, I don't think it's, I'm always gonna advocate for physical activity, that's that's my position, but I'm very aware there are many other competing priorities and there may be other more pressing issues for nations to think about. Um, and that's that's what we employ policymakers to do, to consider the evidence and, and make that decision. But what I would put in front of people is the evidence that this could be a ticking time bomb or type 2 diabetes could be a ticking time bomb and physical activity is one strong way to prevent against it and I'll try and provide them with as much information to help them do that if that's what they decide to do. Thank you Tessa, that was me, thank you.